Thank you. Thank you. That's a really nice welcome. It probably feels a bit odd coming to a TED talk and this guy rocks up playing a piano. Um, I, I promise I'm not going to dance or I'm not going to sing or do anything else. That would definitely be one reason for a TED talk to go viral, but for the wrong reasons. So my name is Owen O'Kane and I'm going to talk today about how my life found a way in the midst of bombs, bullets and bullying and how a piano, believe it or not, was my salvation. Um, in the midst of kind of working through the aftermath of shame, fear, and anxiety. Now, I, I work as a psychotherapist and an author for a living, but today, really, I want to I talk as a human being who knows a little bit about human struggle. And it all started for me back in Northern Ireland during a period of sectarian violence known as the Troubles. So there was a lot of bombs and bullets, and as a kid, just to give you some context, I would sleep with my fingers on my ears just to block out the noise, really. Now, I've got hundreds of memories of growing up in the Troubles, too many actually, it would take me a day to give that talk. But I've got loads of memories, and one that springs to mind is coming out of a department store one day with my younger brother. We were probably 12, 13, and a bomb went off, and within a millisecond, we were covered in head to toe in glass and blood. I can remember tasting blood in my mouth, and hearing ringing in my ears, and people screaming, and miraculously, we walked away relatively unhurt. Now here's the interesting thing. About five minutes later, we walked up the road, went to the shop, bought some chocolate, and then went home as if nothing had happened. And I think that was the reality for many people. It was just normal to be living through bombs and bullets. But you know, there were, there were darker moments. Um, my late mum, her younger brother was shot dead during the Troubles. And I remember the day he was killed, I went in and I found my mum in the kitchen floor. And I can remember picking her up from the floor and she was trembling so much I could barely, you know, I could barely hold her. And I can remember she caught my eye and she said, please tell me this is not happening. Please tell me this is not happening. But the reality is it was and loss and suffering and heartache was a big part of the story. But for me, there was another part of the story, and that was bullying. Now, I'm going to give you a bit of context for the bullying. So I was a kid who was probably a bit different. I was playing piano, liked show tunes, and had a bit of an odd thing for John Travolta when I was a teenager. So I think you can probably guess where this is going. So <laughs> there was a great moment when I was with my mom, my mom walking home from school one day, and we bumped into a neighbour, and my mum randomly, now to this day, I still don't know why my mum did this, but my mum told the neighbour that I was great to go shopping with, and that I loved Barbara Streisand. <laughs> and I think that was probably my first public outing. Now, here's the here's really fascinating thing about that. This neighbour that she was telling all this stuff to, I'm a psychotherapist, and to this day, I still don't know what emotions were going on. She looked frightened, she looked perplexed, she looked a bit freaked by the fact that I was kind of playing show tunes and listening to Barbara Streisand. But she then went quiet and she looked at me and she said, you know what you need to do? You need to take up boxing. Well, there you go, that was interesting. <laughs> I don't think the international boxing community needed to fear too much about me getting into that arena. But I said to her, why do you think I should take up boxing? And she said, it will make you more like the other boys. And interestingly, that was a message I had repeated hundreds of times in my formative years. I needed to be more like the other boys, but I didn't know how to be. And there was a moment one day, four boys approached me. I didn't know who they were. And one of them looked at me and he simply said, queer. And then in unison, all of the boys spat into my face at one time, to the point that I couldn't see in front of me. I had so much saliva on my face, I couldn't see in front of me. And they walked away laughing, and I can remember this lady coming over, and she gave me a tissue, and she said, wipe that off quickly before anyone sees you. And I can remember that was the first time in my life I felt ashamed to be me. And that was more scary than the bombs and the bullets. But there was salvation for me, thankfully. And the salvation came in the form of a piano. Now, here's how that happened. I was in primary school, and my teacher brought in a tambourine, xylophone, 
and the triangle. Now, as a little gay kid, something in my brain went ping, <laughs> particularly the tambourine. Long story short, she realized I had a good ear for music. She said, why don't you audition for music school, which I do. I win a scholarship to play piano, and before I know it, I'm learning to play piano. And today, I'm going to talk you through what the piano taught me. I'm going to play some music for you at the moment. I'm going to play the same tune twice, and all I want you to do is to listen to the difference second time around when I play. I'm sure you'll agree, second time round that sounds incredibly different. It feels much more open, easier to listen to. So when I was learning to play piano, the incredible discovery I had was that I had a choice in how I played music. And I also believe as human beings that we have a choice in how we play the music of our lives. And as a little boy, I was always getting into trouble with my music teacher because she would say, oh, and stick to the music play what's in front of you. And that never made sense to me because I would think, well, what about what I think? What about my take on it? I wanted to connect to the music. And what I discovered was when I connected to the music and when I interpreted the music in a way was, that was helpful for me, then suddenly the music came alive. Now, of course, what I know now from my experience professionally and what we know from psychology and neuroscience is exactly the same in life. When we connect to who we are, when we connect to the people that matter, when we connect to the things that matter in our life, suddenly we come alive. And often we're not, often we're disconnected and we're on autopilot. And it works the same way with the way we interpret the music of our life because it's very easy, particularly in tough times, to get caught up in the, you know, feeling powerless or feeling victimized or feeling angry or feeling furious with life. But actually you have a choice in the way you interpret your life. So today I'd really encourage you to think about that. How connected are you to your life? How connected are you? And how are you interpreting your life? Because you have choice in that. And that choice will give you incredible power. Just like the power of music. How you play the music of your life is your power. But in music we have other lessons to teach. In music we talk a lot about rhythm. Now again, I'm gonna play a bit of music and all I want you to do momentarily is I want you to just listen to the music and I want you to notice what happens to you when you're listening to the music. A little bit of jazz for you there. I want to ask you a question before I, before I talk about this. How many people momentarily, now if this resonates with you, I just want you to raise your hand for me. How many people, when you were listening to that music, momentarily forgot about the things that are going on in their life at the moment, the things that are bothering them? If you just momentarily got lost in the music for a moment, just hold up your hand. Now that's, that's incredible actually. From what I can see, that's pretty most people in the room. And that tells us something really powerful about finding a steady rhythm. Finding an internal steady rhythm. Because what I discovered as a little boy when I was playing piano was that I loved tunes that had a rhythm. Because I would play the tunes and suddenly I'd forget. But here's the interesting thing. I also felt less anxious. And that was pretty incredible. I would feel significantly less anxious when I was playing this music and I never understood why. But what I know now is often our right brain is overactivated. There's a part of, part of the brain called the amygdala on the right-hand side. It's often w working way harder than it needs to. And of course, when I was playing music, it was helping me steady. It was helping me find quiet. So what I'd really encourage you to think about today is how you find your internal steady rhythm. Whatever works for you, use it. You know, for me, it's music. For you, it might be music, but it could be running, going to the gym, 
Pilates, yoga, painting, it doesn't matter. Whatever quietens your mind and whatever helps you feel steady, engage with that because when you have a steady platform, not only will you cope better with whatever life brings you, but you can flourish and you build because we cannot build in life. If we have a wobbly platform, we can't grow and develop. So one of the priorities is to find your rhythm, create an internal steady rhythm, because when you find that, life comes alive in a very, very different way. But of course, it's not just about rhythm. In music, we also talk about minor and major chords. Now, for anyone who isn't musical, I'm just going to give you a rapid-fire music lesson on minor and major chords. A major chord sounds like that. A minor chord, a bit more oppressive. Now, here was my discovery. As a teenage boy playing piano, I realized that if I changed one note in a minor chord, it would sound different. So here's your minor chord again. And I make one adjustment. Suddenly it sounds, can you hear the difference? It sounds louder. And that was an incredible discovery for me because I realized that I didn't like the minor chords. I wanted to play the major chords because they sounded happy, they felt better, and I wanted to avoid the minor chords. But I also realized that the minor chords had to be there. You know, there was no option. Minor chords are part of music. Some of the best music and symphonies in the world are a combination of minor and major chords. And of course, that's exactly true of our lives. You know, I'm pretty confident most of you today will have minor chords in your life. Heartache, suffering, loss, trauma, difficulties from your past. You will suffer at times. And I'm also confident that you will have periods in your life where you have major chords. You know, when you're successful, when you're happy, when you're in love, when things are going well. And the key thing to remember is that when the minor keys of your life overwhelm you, you can do what I did today by just often making a simple adjustment. I change one note today, and that transformed that chord. Likewise, if you're struggling with the minor chords, often it's about a single adjustment, and often the way we think, how we manage our emotions, how we talk to ourselves, and I can't say how important this is. Most people treat themselves appallingly. If you can change that internal voice and in how you talk to yourself, that adjustment can suddenly make things feel much more manageable. So what I'd say to you, whatever the minor and major chords are in your life, embrace all of them. They're not wrong, they're not mistakes, they're meant to be here. They're part of our human experience. And when we embrace all of them, again, we come alive in a very, very different way. Now, if you're anything like me as a human being, when things are difficult in your life, you will have particular approaches to life. Now, I'm going to demonstrate a few of these approaches through the piano. You might identify with one or two of these. So you're having a tough time in life. Things are not going very well for you. You may go for this approach. Now, I think we all know what that sounds like. And that is, uh, this is not fair, this is awful, this is terrible. My life is rubbish. Why do awful things happen to me? It's all terrible. Does that sound familiar? Okay, great. Now here's another model that's very, very popular. And that's the chaos model. And I think, again, we all know the chaos model. You know, we kind of chaotically get involved in our lives and we try and manage it through chaos, the way we think, the way we behave, the way we act. This next one, I have to hold my hands up. This is probably the one I'm an expert in. You know, I'm Irish, Catholic, and gay, so that makes me an expert in shame. <laughs> so as the expert in shame, what I'm quite good at is I'm quite good at tiptoeing around. It's all okay, it doesn't matter. I'll just bury that. I'll just put that away for another time. And this, these are the games that we play. We adopt all of these approaches to our life when actually we have a choice that we can, we can do something very different. We can embrace the life that we've got. And we can embrace the life that we've got as exactly as it is, not how we want it to be. It's about how we work with life as it is. And something quite incredible happens then because it gives you the choice to create a masterpiece in your life. And then something magical happens.
Every person in the room today will have their version of bombs, bullets, and bullying. I know that. I also know that everyone in the room today has their version of a piano within them. And what I'd really encourage you to do is to find, to find your piano and to really think about what we've been talking about today. How are you playing the music of your life? Really stop and think about how you're playing the music of your life. How connected are you to your life? Think about your internal rhythm. How steady are you? Find that steady place because from that, some incredible things can happen. The minor and major chords of your life, embrace all of it and notice the change that can make for you. And finally, remember that only you can be responsible for creating the masterpiece that is your life. Today's probably one of the most difficult and challenging talks I've ever done in my career. And if I'm being honest about that, the reason it's difficult and challenging is that for the first time in my life, in the first time in my career, I made a decision to bring my anxiety, my fear, and my shame with me onto the stage today. And that's bloody scary. We have one life, and we have a choice about how we play the music of our life. Whatever the music of your life, make every note count. Thank you for giving me the honor of telling my story. Thank you.